Hello everyone, it's Mick Sullivan, which means this is The Past and the Curious. In fact, this is the 49th episode of The Past and the Curious, which is pretty awesome. And I'm very excited about it. I know, I know, I say that every episode, but you know, I'm excited about every episode. Why else would I do an episode about them, right? You might find that this episode is a little bit more serious than some of the other episodes. There's still a ton of really interesting stuff, and that's just the nature of the stories, and they're stories that I wanted to tell. I've been wanting to tell them for a long time. I've actually been thinking about this episode for half a year, maybe. I really want the stories to make you think. I want you to think about how someone's home matters to them, whether they are alive or whether they passed away, and maybe we could or could not ever learn their story. If that doesn't make sense now, it'll make sense after you listen to these stories. So the first one is about a man named Yaro Mamut. You may remember Charles Wilson Peel as the man we featured in episode 34, all about museums. In Philadelphia's Independence Hall, above the very room where the Declaration of Independence was signed, he opened a museum to display a whole bunch of unusual things. There were mammoth skeletons, ancient artifacts, a wily and well-traveled little prairie dog, and a wall full of portraits of very important people. He painted those VIP portraits himself. Peel, among everything else, was a remarkable artist, and the paintings that he made of the many people who lived in the late 1700s are some of the best of the time period. We should remember that in the 1700s, there was no television or computers. There weren't even photographs. So the average person would probably never actually catch a glimpse of someone famous like George Washington or Ben Franklin in person, which meant that they might not know what they really looked like. Isn't that a funny thing to consider? If you were alive at the time and wondered what a person looked like, looking at a portrait was just about the only way to see a famous face. So curious people were happy to pay Peel's museum admission to see paintings of these very important people, and finally put faces with the names they had heard about all the time. The old animal parts and the little prairie dog that Peel had on display, they were just a nice bonus. Now Peel was just one man, and he couldn't paint everyone. A Peel portrait was typically an honor reserved for only the most notable people. Presidents, founding fathers, famous personalities. You had to do something pretty special to get a Peel portrait. And here's another thing to keep in mind. This was the 1700s in America and the early 1800s. So all of the faces that tended to fit those descriptions at that time were white faces. All except for one. On the wall that Peel filled from floor to ceiling with portraits in his museum, One painting certainly stuck out to any visitor. It was the face of a black man, and he was very old, and the dark skin on his narrow face was accented by white tufts of beard hair. In the painting, he's wearing a knit cap on his head, like one you'll probably be getting out soon with the rest of your winter clothes, if you haven't already. The old man's eyes look bright and strong, and his expression was one of satisfaction. It's an incredible face to look at, and many people have wondered, Who was this man? In a way, the portrait happened by accident. In 1819, Peel had traveled from his home in Baltimore to Washington, D.C. to paint James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States. While there, Peel's curiosity was piqued when he heard about a free black man who was a practicing Muslim and who not only owned a home in nearby Georgetown, but was a successful businessman who had helped finance the bank. This was remarkable, and because this was 46 years before the Civil War and the end of slavery, it was very unusual. This man was called Yaro Mamut, and people said he was 140 years old. That part was fake. He was probably around 80 at the time, but everything else was true. Peel had to make a special trip across the Potomac River to meet Yaro, talk with him about his life, and have him sit for a very unusual portrait. Now, painting portraits takes a lot of time, as you might imagine, which means there's plenty of time to talk. And that's what Yaro did. 
The little that we know about him today is mostly because Peel wrote much of it down. It's a pretty amazing story and one that challenges our ideas of the people who were living and thriving in America at the time. In the year 1715, Yarrow was only 14 when he was captured and taken from his home in West Africa. He, like millions of other men, women, and children, was a victim of the slave trade. People were kidnapped from their lands, taken to another, and forced into labor. Yarrow's people were known as the Fulani, and it is believed that his family were wealthy Muslim leaders in this community. Historians think this because Yarrow knew how to read and write both in the Fulani language as well as Arabic. Later in his life, he learned to read and write a bit of English as well, making him literate in three languages. That's a feat for anyone at the time, but especially unusual for someone who would live much of his life in slavery. Most enslaved people would be kept from learning to read and write at all, but for Yarrow, it helped him stand out. After the terrible journey on a slave ship across the Atlantic Ocean, Yarrow landed in Maryland, where a man named Bell bought him directly off the boat. Everything and everyone Yarrow knew was gone, never to be seen again. The man who legally purchased him was a wealthy farmer who owned several properties that depended on the work of enslaved people. Farms, water mills, things like that. Pretty quickly, though, Bell figured out that Yarrow was more well-suited for work other than hard plantation labor. Luckily for Yarrow, his education led to another role. He became what is known as a body servant. In this role, young Yarrow traveled with Bell everywhere he went. When he met with other farmers, Yarrow was there. When he met the people he would sell his grain to, Yarrow was there. When he met with powerful politicians, Yarrow was also there. And nearly every one of those people would remember meeting Yarrow Mahmud. How could you not? He was obviously incredibly talented and smart. But also, by being in the room when business was happening, Yaro was able to learn how to make it happen himself. Along the way, Yaro learned other skills. One in particular would lead to his freedom, brick making. Think about how important this was. Nearly every building in America that wasn't made of wood was made with bricks. And on top of that, many streets and many towns were also brick. That's a lot of bricks. And Yarrow made a lot of bricks in his long life. And since that's the case, you could walk by any old building near Washington, DC and unknowingly walk by bricks that Yarrow himself might have made. We have no way of knowing most of these, but we know one. The Bell family agreed to give him his freedom after he finished making the bricks for their new family home. Finishing the job at the age of 60 Yaro Mahmud was finally free after 44 years of enslavement. This was a fate that other enslaved men and women longed for more than any other. Between his freedom at 60 and his death at the age of 87, Yaro Mahmud was a familiar face around the Georgetown area of Washington, DC. He was always working, which meant tending to some basic crops, making bricks, weaving, even making charcoal. After he used the money earned from these jobs to buy a modest house, which he owned outright, he used any more of his income for investments. In addition to holding stock in the bank in Georgetown, he regularly lent money to people in need. Usually it was to someone looking to start a business. And once they had some success and earned some money, they would repay Yarrow with interest. This meant they would pay him back more than he had lent them. And this helped him grow as a businessman too. It's hard to stress just how unusual this was for a man like Yarrow in America. His fellow Georgetown neighbors also remembered how the well-liked Yarrow would head to his garden several times a day to face Mecca and pray. This is traditional for people of the Muslim faith and something that he had kept from his childhood in Africa decades before. It is said that when he died, he was buried in that very garden. But as often happens with old places, especially in growing cities, the remnants of his life slowly disappeared. It wasn't a complete disappearance. His house was on a street that you can still find on a map of Washington, D.C. today. It's called Dent Place. But in the 1880s, everything there was torn down and the site was cleared for newer, bigger buildings. Whatever survived from Yaro Mahmoud's life 
maybe even including his skeleton, was buried by a city growing up. Around the year 2012, almost 200 years after Yarrow's death, the man who now owned the property wanted to knock down those buildings from the 1880s, the ones that were built over what was left of Yarrow's life. Luckily, before the new townhomes that stand there today were built, someone spoke up. A few people knew what might be buried there and were hopeful what more information about Yarrow could teach us. The new owner, who happened to be Muslim himself like Yarrow, agreed to pause construction so that they could dig. If this hadn't happened, all of Yarrow's physical history, the items from his life would be buried yet again, this time under buildings that might stand up for centuries. It was a rare chance, so archaeologists were invited to excavate the site and see what might lie below the surface. All sorts of objects were found, thousands actually, but Yarrow's bones were never located. Whether they are ever found or not shouldn't matter, because more importantly, the attention brought by the dig made more and more people aware of Yarrow Mahmud. He may have been famous enough to get a peel portrait in his day, but he certainly didn't make it into many history books. And though his story is not well known, more and more people are learning about it. Yarrow's story matters to us in a lot of ways. For one, it's a reminder that you may never know who lived in the very same places that you spend your time today. The answers can surprise you, and it's always interesting to learn and think about to me. But he also shows us that the people living and working and succeeding in America looked and felt a lot of different ways. There should be more stories like his, and there probably are. We hope people continue to find them and continue to share them. This month's You Have 30 Seconds comes from Lonnie in Portland, Oregon. Take it away, Lonnie. I live in Portland, Oregon, and today I'm going to tell you how my city got its name. In 1845, Francis Pettigrove and Asa Lovejoy both had names in mind for a clearing that was soon to become a city. Francis's was Portland after Portland, Maine. Asa's was Boston after Boston, Massachusetts. To decide, they flipped a coin and Portland won. Workers chopped down trees and started making Portland. Unfortunately, during all the chopping and building, indigenous people's homes were destroyed. Many indigenous peoples have been kicked out of their land and unfairly moved to others. This is something I want people to understand. Lonnie, thank you so much. That was a really important thing to share with people. I appreciate it. And if anyone out there would like to submit a You Have 30 Seconds of your own, it's very easy to do. The instructions are on the website, thepastandthecurious.com. Here's a shovel. Can you dig it? It's quiz time. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. Time, time. That's right, you already know it. It's quiz time, and these quiz questions are about things underground, archaeological digs that unearthed some interesting stuff. Question number one. England's King Richard III met his end during the War of Roses at the Battle of Bosworth Field in the 1400s. He was buried hastily, and the body was lost to time. In 2012, though, his remains were discovered underneath something very common. What were they underneath? In another case of important things being buried underneath other, less important things, the famous King of England spent years, decades, centuries beneath a parking lot. Or a car park if you're British. Either way, it wasn't exactly a dignified way to spend eternity for a former King of England. Though he did also have a play written about him by Shakespeare, but I don't think Shakespeare did him any favors. Question number two. One day in 1974, farmers in China were digging a well when they discovered something very unusual. In fact, there were so many of these unusual things that archaeologists are still uncovering them today. Thousands have been uncovered so far. Do you know what it is they found underground? Lots and lots and lots of statues made of terracotta, which is a type of clay. 2,200 years ago, thousands of statues of soldiers, animals, and courtesans were created to accompany a deceased emperor in the afterlife. They are known as the Terracotta Army and are beautifully detailed and unique figures, all of which sat buried and hidden under beautiful farmland for centuries. The third and final question. 
The terrible events of 9-11 will long be remembered by the world. Crews spent years afterwards clearing the site of debris after the World Trade Center buildings in New York collapsed. While doing so, they dug deep below the foundation under where the buildings once stood. Do you know what they found deep, deep in the New York City soil underneath that building site? They found a ship. And what's crazy is how it got there. Manhattan is an island, but it used to be a much smaller island. And people wanted to make it bigger, so they'd fill the banks with old stuff, even garbage, which would be covered with soil. Slowly, the island grew, and they'd build on top of the land that they created on their own. One of the things used to expand the island was an old, damaged ship. Amazingly, the wood was so well preserved deep underground that scientists called dendrochronologists were able to learn that the wood used to build the boat had been taken from near Philadelphia and it had been chopped down in 1773. The California baseball team known as the Los Angeles Dodgers once made their home on the opposite side of America in Brooklyn, New York. When the team first started playing baseball in New York in the 1880s, they were actually known simply as the Brooklyn Ball Club. And let's admit it, that's a pretty boring name compared to the colorful characters and descriptive designations of other teams of the day, like the St. Louis Perfectos and the Boston Bean Eaters. So the press started looking to give them a nickname with some pizzazz. As the story goes, over the span of one summer, four of the team's members each got married. Maybe this would stick, the press thought. For years, they were known as the Brooklyn Bridegrooms. It's got a certain ring to it, sure, but it's not quite like the Dodgers. That name comes from the maze of trolley tracks that twisted and turned all over the Brooklyn neighborhood. In order for locals to get anywhere safely, including a baseball game, they had to dodge the dangerous trolley cars at every turn, which is why they eventually shed the bridegroom's nickname to become the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers. By the 1930s, they became more simply the Brooklyn Dodgers. And 10 years later, by the 1940s, the Dodgers decided to leave Brooklyn altogether and look for a new home. See, the city government in New York wouldn't give them the space they wanted for a state-of-the-art stadium. So they looked west really far west. For the first time in American life, travel by airplane was an easy possibility, and sports teams were able to travel quickly to the other side of the country in order to play other teams. So, the Dodgers were planning to be the first major league team in sunny California. The ultimate Dodger destination was Los Angeles, where, as it happened, an entire community of people also found themselves needing to relocate to new homes. Among these people was a woman named Aurora Vargas. She was the widow of a fallen soldier and lived with her family, the Arachegas. The people of Aurora Vargas's community weren't moving because they wanted to. They were moving because they had to. At least some of them were. Aurora was not one of those. She made it very clear that she was not going anywhere if there was anything that she could do about it. The area where this story happens is often called Chavez Ravine. It's a place in Los Angeles named after the man who once owned it, Julian Chavez. In the early 1800s, this hardworking man left his home in Mexico for the opportunities of the small but growing town of Los Angeles. At the time, there was so much land that someone could simply make a request to the Ayuntamiento, which was the local council that governed the area. If the request was approved, the land was free. That's how much of it there was. So Julian Chavez got the land, used it well, and worked his way up in city politics. Eventually, the hilly ravine a few miles from downtown LA developed into separate but very tight-knit neighborhoods of Mexican Americans. There were three distinct communities, La Loma, Palo Verde, and Bishop. And by the 1930s, there were over 1,000 families living their lives in the hilly terrain that was once owned by Julian Chavez. It didn't look like life in a typical American city. In fact, you might have thought you wandered into a European or South American village. 
Colorful wooden houses stood out from the hillside. Some were aided by stilts to level the houses against the unlevel ground. People buzzed about, children ran underfoot, and even chickens and pigs and goats were a regular part of life. Grandparents tended gardens, young people sang songs, and radios could be heard around the clock in the homes with electricity. Some people living here traveled the short distance to the city for work, but others stayed in the community, which felt like it was a world away from downtown. This was because the geography of the land seemed to keep it hidden from the rest of the city. It was tucked away from the rest of the world. Most of the people there had little money, but for the most part, they were happy. The community took care of each other and didn't want for much. All too often, progress comes at a cost. And so it was with progress in Los Angeles. But those who would pay the cost were Aurora Vargas, her family, the Arachegas, and the thousands of people living their lives in La Loma, Palo Verde, and Bishop. Thanks to some money from the U.S. government, the city of Los Angeles was planning to make some changes. One of these changes included building a giant housing project on this very same land that Julian Chavez originally settled. This housing project was going to be several large buildings, each of which would have affordable apartments for many, many families. In order to build these buildings, though, the planners would need the land upon which the homes of La Loma, Palo Verde, and Bishop sat. Of course, this meant the people would need to move, too. On one hand, a new construction project would provide homes for many more people. On the other, it would force the people who had built a community there to leave. In order to get them out, residents were offered some money for the land and the promise of top choice of apartments in the new building once it was complete. Many people from the Mexican-American communities accepted the offer, but others, like Aurora Vargas and the Arachegas, did not. This was their home, and they did not want to leave. They'll have to drag me out, she'd say. And this fight went on for years. Though some of the holdouts eventually left, many remained. It actually dragged on for so long that the plan to build the new buildings fell through. Construction was halted. The city was not going to build the housing project after all. Even after most of the people had left their homes. Now why it fell through is a little too much for us to cover here, and you'd probably get bored if we did. But for those who may be curious, let's just say it had something to do with a city planner getting caught up in a thing called the Red Scare. Though it might have felt like a victory when the city called the project off, the feeling didn't last long. Now that the building wasn't going to happen, and most of the people had left, the land became prime location for a baseball stadium. Los Angeles wanted a baseball team, and the Dodgers wanted land to build their dream home. Chavez Ravine was, to them, a perfect place. The blueprints for the stadium looked great. It was actually state-of-the-art. Some would call it the nicest stadium in America at the time. Also a plus, it would be close to the interstate, and unlike their old home in Brooklyn, there would be plenty of parking for baseball fans, and no trolleys to dodge. All that stood in their way were a few people who were still unwilling to leave their homes. By 1959, there were about 20 holdouts on the land who would not take the offer of money, who simply did not want to leave their home. Yet again, Aurora Vargas said, they'll have to drag me out. But it hadn't come to that yet. There were court battles, as well as battles for public opinion in the newspapers of the day. Some people asked, is the city having a baseball team worth fighting with citizens over land that was rightfully theirs? Is there a way to compromise? Others asked, why don't they just leave already? But nothing could stop the forward motion of progress once the bulldozer wheels started turning. The city set a date for demolishing the buildings. And then they would flatten the hilly land. But before all of that, they had to remove the final residents. Members of the press were on hand to document the fateful day, the day the final holdouts would be escorted from the land, some with force. The cameras clicked as the confrontation unfolded, and the scene was printed in papers for all to see. Perhaps the most powerful image captured that day was a photo of Aurora Vargas. Just as she said they'd have to do, she was literally carried from her home. The anger and anguish on her face is very clear to see, as men lift her by her four limbs. She had done everything she could, but even though she had lost, she had kept her word. They had to drag her out. 
April 10, 1962 was opening day for the Dodgers, and they finally took the field in their beautiful new stadium. There was no sign of La Loma, Palo Verde, or Bishop. The home Aurora shared with her parents, the Arishegas, had disappeared. Even the rough and mysterious contours of the ravine were gone, flattened as perfectly as the deep green baseball field. This may seem like a distant memory or something far in the past, perhaps like Yaro Mahmoud's long lost home, but there are still people alive today whose childhood homes stood somewhere around center field, or maybe one over there by third base, or another along the first base foul line. As you might imagine, these people have a lot of feelings about the homes, the communities being gone and even more feelings about what stands in their place today. It's easy to understand why Aurora Vargas felt the way she felt all of those years ago. Some people are attached to their homes, and that is an important feeling. She and her family eventually moved east of the ravine, but still stayed in LA. Every so often, a newspaper would find her and check in on her story, probably because her image from that day was so memorable and so powerful. She carried on with her life like any other person would have done, she went to work, she kept her family close, and she thought about her old house often. But still today, it's important to remember that Aurora Vargas stood up, and that should be celebrated. Thank you for listening. My name is Mick Sullivan, and this has been The Past and the Curious. I wrote this episode. It was really special to put together. And I also did most of the music, except for the song that is in the end of Chavez Ravine, which is a song called William and Lil Lee, performed and written by the Java Men, Todd Hildreth, Craig Wagner, and Ray Rizzo. Very good friends of mine. Incredible musicians. I was excited to use it. Whoa, Nelly, I have some people to thank on Patreon. First off, Leslie, I owe you a shout out. Leslie, Leslie yes, but I'm betting it's probably Leslie? your kids, Leslie. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is Leslie. Leslie? If it's not Leslie and it's somebody else, Thanks, Leslie. you let me know and I will shout them out in the next episode, which will be episode number 50. So that's kind of an honor, right? Uh, so Leslie, yeah! Whoa, Jack, Jack. whoa, Alex, Alex, whoa, Josiah, Josiah. and Laura, Laura in Italy. Heyo. Jack, Alex, Josiah, Laura in Italy. Heyo. Hello. Thank you. I'm so glad you're out there. I'm so glad you found us. Yeah, tell somebody. And man, like, eat some good food for me while you're over there, huh? And last but not least, I have a Patreon sponsor song to share with Ruben and Brunello in Johannesburg, South Africa. Hope you like it, dudes. Ruben and Brunello, your cousin, and such a pair of pretty swell fellows. Turning 10 on the 11th month of the 2020th year. So far away in South Africa, I'll just say happy birthday. Thanks, everybody. Looking forward to episode 50, the big 5-0. It's going to be a fun one. I'm excited about it. I think you're going to like it a lot. Talk to you then. I'm Mick Sullivan, and this has been The Past and the Curious.